Well, all around funny guy and author and business communicator, John Acuff, was kind enough to let me interview him for the podcast. And I wanted to make sure you had a chance to hear from John Acuff. Here we go. John, first of all, big question. How do you pronounce your last name? A cuff, like a shirt sleeve. A okay. Because uh, I, I heard you on one podcast and the guy kept calling you a cuff. And I thought... Yeah, you're not supposed to correct people. It's yeah. Just, I'm, I'm like, uh, it's like when people say that I've written seven New York Times bestsellers. And I'm like, uh, it's two. But if you want to say seven, like, I'm not right. going to fix that. Like, why would no. I correct that? But if I said one, would you correct that? No. No, because like that's the... It's it's really just doing it. Like I don't think that you know. Um, so you no, know, I wouldn't correct that. I don't know that I've. I don't know the last time I corrected somebody when they had wrong information about me. I usually just roll with it. I'm pretty. You know, if you want to call me Jim? All right, this is gonna be a short conversation anyway. We'll be fine. <laughs> okay, so Jim, you live in Florida, where you live on the Everglades and hunt alligators. Tampa, Great to have you. Okay, outside of Tampa. Um, okay, it's the uh, it's the New York of Florida. So yeah, it's my favorite part of Florida. <laughs> that is true. Um, and where you know, <laughs> for our for our listeners who are not aware of John Acuff. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, I live outside of Nashville. Been here for about eleven years, um, which is a fun city to live in. It's having a having a moment. Um, married, uh, just celebrated our twentieth anniversary um, by not going to Italy a third year in a row. Um, so that was that was a fun trip to continually move. I think we'll go for our fiftieth. I think that's what we're gonna do. Like we'll be. If, It'll be our 50th anniversary. I've got a rising senior in high school daughter and a rising sophomore in high school daughter. Um, and I write books and then I go talk to companies about those books. That's kind of the two the two big things I do. And I, I own my own business. Okay. So what is the name of your business? Uh, Acuff Ideas, LLC. So okay. Ideas so really drive the heart of, of what I do. Um, and so they, you know, they can be in pod. I have a podcast called All It Takes Is a Goal. So um, ideas are in books or speeches or my podcast or blogging. So that's that's my favorite thing to do is share ideas that change lives. Give me an idea that changes lives. Um, an idea that changes lives. Um, be a tourist. Um, a lot of people are terrified of change and we are all going through tremendous change right now. So if you'll reframe it and go, I'm a tourist right now. Like, and what do tourists have in common? Um, they asked lots of questions, you know, when Nashville hosted the NFL draft, the streets were full of people going, Hey, where's the river? Where's that restaurant? Where's that hotel? Cause they'd never been here before. So they asked questions. Number two, they don't pretend to be experts. You don't get to learn if you're busy pretending. So they don't pretend like I'm not an expert in Paris. Like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, and gonna need the third thing. They ask for help from experts. They're not afraid to say, Hey, I know somebody's already done this. Can I learn from them? They make mistakes and they have fun. So instead of going, instead of beating yourself up and saying, I'm the worst at change, I can't handle change, I hate change. And change is fascinating because the people that have the hardest time with the change are often the people that are the best at the old way. We think that the people who are excellent at the old way will be the first to change, but they have the most to lose. If you suck at the old way, you can't wait to change. But if you're a leader who's really good at the old way, you're not going to want to change because you have more to lose. And so that's an idea that can reframe how you look at change to say, okay, I'm going to be a tourist in this situation. I'm going to admit I'm somewhere brand new. I told people that constantly this year um, that they should have a, a post-it note that said, this is my first global pandemic and they should put it by their computer because every parent I know is like, I'm terrible. I mean, you're in LA, like you guys are never going to school again. Like you're like, <laughs> you've got to do virtual learning. And so like, I met so many parents from California that would say, I'm the worst at like teaching my kid virtually. And I'd say, of course you are. You probably are terrible at hang gliding. You've never done this. The worst time to learn a new skill is during the middle of a global pandemic. It's the absolute worst time to go. I'm going to add my kids to my house. I'm going to work from home. I'm going to learn 10 new things all at once. So you've got to give yourself some grace. And so I would say an idea like this is my first global pandemic reframes that. Oh, that's right. I shouldn't be an expert at this. I've never done this before. And that that'll change how you approach your day. That's huge. Okay, so when you go and speak to a business and you drop that nugget on them, do you feel like 
that it's received well, or is it just basically like you just said, the people that are really good at what they're doing are the most resistant to change? Or do you feel like, man, people are, are ready for that right now? No, I think people are ready for it right now. I mean, I think the, you know, people know they need to like change, like change. We've always said change isn't a question of whether or not it'll happen. Like it's going to happen. I think the real question is whether or not you'll enjoy it and be part of it. Um, so know that the companies I go to, um, they've won, they've hired me specifically. So there's a million, there's so many good public speakers. Um, and they've said, okay, he has this talk that we really like, or he has this book that we really want to do. Um, you know, and sometimes it's the CEO read the book and then buys a copy for everybody, which is awesome. And so they see a specific thing that I talk about that they have a specific challenge or hope. And so then it, that fits in really well together. I don't, I would say 95% of my public speaking is corporations versus conferences. It's different at a conference at a conference. They, you know, there could be 50 speakers and you're going to connect with two of them or you're going to connect with 10 of them. And like maybe my talk that I do about my latest book or something I say doesn't land the same way. But at a conference, at a, at a corporation, they've said of the 20 speakers we looked at, this is the one that'll help us the most. So by the time I get there, um, we're already sprinting together. A lot of my audiences are so in motion already that they're telling me, I dare you to keep up. So I don't have to do a lot of convincing speeches. Mm. I get to show up to people that are already running. They're a sales force of 1300 people in the healthcare industry. And they're like, let's go. Like, what have you researched in the last three years? It's going to multiply my results. And I go, okay, here, let's talk about that. So I, I have the benefit of talking to a lot of in motion audiences versus a me trying to convince them as an audience. Do you feel like right now, post pandemic, the church is in motion or still scrambling? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the area. I mean, I think the I think I told somebody the challenge with time right now is that the calendar is different. Um, three days is firm. Um, three weeks is fuzzy. Three months is fictional. And that's that's just hard. That's hard because mm -hmm. like I know three days from now, I can almost guarantee that'll happen. Three weeks, a little fuzzier, a little fuzzier. Three months feels like we're getting some fiction. So I think that's what the church is having the same kind of challenge everybody's having with is that you want to do an event and you go, okay, we're going to do a big welcome back live event and we're going to put it here. And you go, oh, well, it's three months out. How, how, like, how certain are we that'll happen? So I, I think that everybody, not just, not just the church, um, I think companies are the same way. I think individuals, schools are the same way. We're all trying to figure out, okay. How do we commit to a decision and then have the flexibility to have the decision change outside of our control? Your content that you have, your ideas, uh, are you naturally a great brainstormer or do you find that you're more of a translator? You see things and then you interpret them for the world. How do, how do you come about your material? That's a great question. Um, I am definitely a brainstormer. I, there's companies that will hire me. Um, and say, hey, we want you to idea SWAT team this. We want you to swoop in and give us a hundred ideas on this challenge we're having, and then back right back out the window on a rope. Like, so that's that's something I love doing. And so, I mean, I'm really deliberate about ideas. Um, I'm, you know, I I really I feel like I always tell people I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in idea bankruptcy. Like I never sit down to a blank piece of paper alone. I always bring friends. So I always have a notebook and I have a running list of ideas. Hmm. So I know, okay, I, I had, you know, 89 ideas in the month of July. Like, how do I know that? Because I started at this number and I ended at this number and I'll then take those ideas and translate them or move them forward. I, my process is pretty simple. I, I call it, um, I record it, I write down the idea. I review it and I release it. I either release it back to the ether, like I'm not going to do anything with it, or I release it and go, you're graduating to the next level. You're like you're going to be in a podcast. You're going to be in a tweet. You're going to be in a book. You're going to be in a speech. You're going to be in a challenge. Like that's kind of how I think about ideas. Okay. The, the difference between preparing a talk and writing a chapter, I mean, sometimes this is where pastors that speak and are great don't often translate well into writers. Sure. Sure. Well, and, but you've been able to do both. Uh, because you communicate from a stage and also from a book. Is the writing process different than the writing process for a, a talk? Yeah. I mean, I th writing's hard for me. I don't, you know, I'm sure there are people that it feels like running through a field with a ribbon. Like writing is hard. It's just, it's really hard. Um, and I've gotten better at it over the years. Like I'm, I'm working on my eighth book, so it has gotten better on um, the process, but no, it's challenging. And so for me, um, you know, here's how I would do a speech. Um, 
if I have a speech I'm going to do and it's a brand new talk that I'm going to do, I'll write the entire thing out. I'll write it all out and then I'll shrink it. I'll kind of like shrink it down. I'll practice it, practice it, practice it, um, you know, to kind of like hone it down to how I'd really say it from stage. Because how I'd write it is different from how I'd say it. Even word choice would be different. And so for me, um, that's, and I kind of like, will hone it down and then go, okay. I love um, the idea of like, I think a speech has islands and bridges. Like the island is the main idea. The bridge is how do I get to the next one? So as long as I have a sense of here's my island, here's how to get to the next one. And I think sometimes people have a great first island, but they left everybody there because there was no bridge to move forward. And so I kind of think about speeches that way. I have the utmost respect for pastors who are creating 30, 40, 50, you know, talks a year. Like that's a completely different animal than what I do where I go, okay, I spent two or three years researching you know, mindset. I worked with a PhD on this project. We worked with thousands of people. Here's this talk that I'm customizing and sharing, but I might share it a hundred times versus I am standing in front of like, w- you know, when I speak at a company, often I don't go back to that company for a year, or maybe five years. Like you're standing in front of the same group that's seen you multiple times, heard the stories. And so, yeah, I, you know, I'm a pastor's kid, so I definitely grew up seeing that happen, but I have a lot of respect for that. So obviously a, a big part of your presentation skill set is comedy. Um, I, when, when speakers, pastors try to blend comedy and content, usually one is, you know, kind of the cart and one is the horse. Yeah. Do you find that it's the content first and then you sprinkle in comedy along the way? Does it come to you on stage and then you go back and you write it down? Or are you like, you know, Leno work in the nightclubs and trying stuff <laughs> yeah. out, that kind of thing? No, um, I, I kind of write in layers or I'll plan a speech in layers. So there's like the idea. I just want to get the idea right. The words aren't even right. I like, I don't edit. Editing and writing are different things. You shouldn't try to do them both at the same time. They're different parts of your brain. So I'll say as I'm writing need quote or need stat, and I'll just put that in and I'll just keep going. Cause if I stop to go look it up online, I'm gone. Like I'm out, like forget it. So I'll do that. I'll do like an idea layer, a word layer, and then I'll go a joke layer. I'm pretty melancholy, like negative, like as a person. So I work pretty hard at positivity and I work hard to go, okay, this feels like a counting crows lyric. How do I change this? Like, this feels like, like so mopey. What's the, what's the positive version of this? How do I, so that's when I'm adding the humor and I'll go, wow, this needs some humor right now. Like this is not, you know, this is not working. You want it to be woven. And I use humor to amplify points. Like I love that Chris Rock says there's some things people won't listen to unless they're laughing at the same time. Mm. And so for me, I use humor as a vehicle for truth. So it's not an either or like, I think you get into trouble when I think pastors, the challenge is sometimes they'll tell a story at the beginning and then they do this hard right turn where they're like, now let's talk about God. And it's like, like they just wanted to tell a football story. And then all of a sudden, like your hard right turn into Isaiah and you're like, how did those that's the island and the bridge. You left me, you left me on the first island because you didn't bridge the. And so I use humor like that way to go, okay, here's, you know, here's something that I think is interesting. So for instance, I do this joke right now about around the idea of overthinking that everything is a thing right now. The reason we're overthinking is everything is a thing. And that's a good, that's a good line. It's a handle, like it's sticky. But then I say, like the other day I went to, uh, I was at uh, out and about and somebody went to shake my hand. And before that, and this is true, like before they shook my hand, I thought, should I refuse? Should I give them a fist bump? Should I twist at the waist and, and give them my elbow? Should I shake their hand, but immediately put my entire arm into a vat of hand sanitizer as if to say, excuse me, while I wash off this deadly pandemic you just tried to murder me and my grandparents with like, is this a handshaking room? What does it say about us politically? And I said, you know what I thought two years ago when somebody tried to shake my hand, nothing. I just shook their hand. So now I've taken a thought. Everything is a thing. I've told you a real story. I've exactly like amplified it, exaggerated. It made it huge so we can all laugh at that. It's relatable because we've all done that. We've all seen like neighbors take three steps back or like, you know, like, so it's relatable that way. So that's kind of an example of how I would use humor to kind of explain something. Who's funny to you? You mentioned Chris Rock. Who do you enjoy? Uh, Nate Bargatze, I think is hilarious. He's great. Um, Gary Goleman is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, Maria Bamford is really smart and really, really funny. Um, 
those are, you know, those are the three that immediately come to mind. Um, as just, I mean, Seinfeld was my favorite show growing up, like sitcom wise, but yeah, those are the three that I really like whenever I recommend, you know, so, or Dustin Nickerson, he's a West coast guy. He's killing it right now too. We've had him like, in several times. He's great. Yeah, He's super funny. So like g- guys and girls like that, I like, I like that type of humor. I'm not a huge slapstick. I don't like dark comedy. Like I don't want to walk away feeling terrible about my life. Like the rest of life can do that. I don't need comedy to also do that. Right. Right. So let's talk about uh, your latest book, uh, soundtracks. Uh, I think this is a concept that a lot of us have, I mean, that, that's the brilliance of the book is immediately you, you read the premise and you go, Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But this idea that there's these, these playlists, these soundtracks, these, tapes if you know if you're from our era uh playing in the back of our heads that really become the definition of who we are how'd you come up with this and why'd you decide to write a book about it well i mean i i i decided to write a book about it i i kind of look at um starting a business writing a book giving a speech um i think there's three things that are always present in a best-selling idea um the number one is a passionate connection you have a personal connection to it Um, So you're passionately engaged. The second is there's a real need. People actually need it. And the third is there's a spot in the marketplace for you. So for instance, I wrote this book, Finish, about finishing goals. And I really, and I, my connection was I never finished. I have like a hundred half started notebooks on my shelf. I've had like, I haven't read, so I've started and not finished so many books. And so I wanted to get better at finishing, passionate connection. People came up to me and said, Hey, I liked your book, Start, this other book I wrote. And they were like, but I've never had a problem starting. How do I finish? And so I started to look up the research. 92% of all New Year's resolutions fail, according to the University of Scranton. Um, so I was like, wow, there's a need. And then I went on Amazon and checked the marketplace. And if you search the word finish, the only thing that comes up is laundry detergent and dishwasher detergent. And it's because we as a culture celebrate the beginning and we ignore the ending because the ending's hard and it's challenging. And we say stupid stuff like well begun is half done. Like, no, it, no, it's not. It's really not. Like if a surgeon said to you, as soon as I make the first incision, I'm half done with your surgery, you'd be like, you're terrible at medicine. Um, that can't be true. And so when I went to write this book, I was like, okay, ha- changing how I think changed my life going back all the way to 2008. I kind of learned how to control my thoughts in a different way. I am an overthinker. I tend to overthink things. So I had a personal connection. Um, the PhD, this guy, Mike Peasley, who helps me do research, we asked 10,000 people if they struggle with overthinking and 99.5% of them said yes. So the need was gigantic. And this is before 2020. Like 2020 was catnip for overthinking. Because again, you're thinking about handshakes. Like, you know, you know. And then the last thing was I checked the marketplace and there's some great books about it, but a lot of them come from a place of stop it, stop it, stop it. And my thought was one, I don't think that's possible. Like two, why would I ever turn off this amazing thinking machine? Like what if I just fed it with good thoughts, not bad thoughts? Like what if it could become a superpower? And so that was when I had those three things lined up, I was like, okay, that's a topic I can really spend years trying to help people with and and create a, a book about. Um, and so for me, I pick soundtracks because it, I just think musically they change a whole scene and often without you knowing, and that's the power of a thought, a, you know, a soundtrack is just a repetitive thought and it has the power to change the whole moment. And we often don't notice it. And we certainly, most people don't understand they can choose their thoughts and choose their soundtracks. So that was kind of how the title came about. Excuse me for just a second while I interrupt this episode. Just want to remind you about our mission right now to sponsor 1,000 kids through Compassion International. Go to their website for more information. Click on Compassion.com slash Rusty to sponsor a child. We're trying to sponsor as many as we can and help out kids that have been left behind through the COVID season. So do that right now and then go back to the show. Compassion.com slash Rusty. Uh, tell me about some of the common soundtracks that a lot of us have playing in the background. Um, I'm too old. I'm too young. Like whatever the thing is, um, I'm too old to do this. I'm too young to do that. Um, you know, my past prevents my future. Um, who am I to do that? Um, I'm underqualified to do that. Um, the easiest way to find a broken soundtrack and a broken one is one that's not helpful. The easiest way is to write down something you want to do. Like it could be start a podcast. It could be start a family. It could be, you know, own my own business. It could be, you know, go to Hawaii, like write down a desire you have, 
read the whole Bible in a year, whatever, and then listen to your first reaction because every reaction is an education. And if your first thoughts don't propel you forward and go, you can do that. We, yeah, uh, we have to do that. Let's figure that out. Then there's probably a broken soundtrack. It's, it takes 30 seconds to find a broken soundtrack. Tell me about being a pastor's kid. How did that prepare you for what you're doing now? Oh, well, watching my dad, it like the idea that people can stand on stage and share ideas is a hundred percent from watching my dad speak every weekend. And he started a Southern Baptist church in Massachusetts in the 1980s. No one was doing that. Like that, it wasn't like he was the thousandth to do that. It was super unusual. So he had to use humor and, you know, practical, actionable stuff in his sermons. And, and just, he couldn't coast on um, kind of, I grew up in the church Christianity. Like there wasn't a common language, like in the South where I live now, like people here in the South ask you where you go to church. Like no one in Massachusetts would ever ask a coworker, Hey, where do you guys go to church? Like we just do that as a, like, it's like saying, what's your favorite grocery store. And so watching him do that a hundred percent prepared me, um, from, for sharing ideas from the stage. Mm, okay. So tell me this, because you have, you're in a similar situation to me. You're the only guy in your home. I have two daughters, uh, 18 and seven or 18 and 16 about to be. Oh, that's almost, yeah. We're like months away from each other. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a different world. What have you learned from family and just raising daughters that, uh, helps you do what you do? Well, I mean, I learn from them all the time. My oldest daughter said to me um, recently, dad, you only have two speeds. You're either OCD or no CD. And I thought that's really, that's really smart. And she was right. Like I tend to go all or nothing. And so I'm kind of saying, okay, well, what would it look like to have a balanced approach? And so I think you're, you're constantly learning from them. Um, I think when you have more than one kid, you realize they came to the, the planet with brains. Like they got yeah. gifts, like they got specific gifts. It's really easy when you only have one kid to go, no, this is how, like, we taught her all this or we, you know, but when you have two kids that have different personalities, different passions, different thinking, I think you learn quickly, like, oh, that's right. Like they came to the planet with some stuff, like God gave them different approaches to life. So I, I, I feel like I learned stuff from them constantly. Um, they, uh, they, I, I've also learned they don't want me to do uh TikTok or Instagram reels. Like they would kill me if I, if I, if they ever catch me dancing to some song or like, they're going to murder me. So I, they, they do their best to kind of have me not embarrass them in public ways. But I think every kid does that. <laughs> well, then we're living in the same household. That's great. Uh, what do you, what do you think the soundtracks or how as a parent, are you trying to create the right soundtracks for your kids so that years later they're not in therapy for how you raise them? Let me interrupt for just a moment. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? In fact, all of our podcasts are now recorded and placed on YouTube as well. So ever wanted to look at the person I'm talking to? Now you can. Go to Pastor Rusty George on YouTube and subscribe. All right, back to our show. Well, I mean, they're going to be in therapy. So I'm not like, let's take that right off. the Like, there's nothing you're going to do as a parent that is going to prevent that kid from going to therapy. Like, that's good. So I, I like, once you accept that, you're like, okay, well, let's, let's go. Um, it depends on the amount, I guess, or the cost. Like, I don't want the therapist to get a boat because of stuff I've done, but they're definitely going to see a therapist. <laughs> um, I think part of it is you talk about it. Here's the thing with soundtracks. Kids get it faster than adults because they don't have 20 years of old ones to unlearn. Like when you mm. teach a kid the truth, they sprint. Like that's just how it is. So when you go, hey, you can choose to think this about yourself. They go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let's go. Um, so I've, you know, we've had so many parents go, paid my son to read your book. My 13-year-old read it. My 14-year-old read it. Like, so I think some of it is saying, using the nomenclature out loud. Hey, I think that might be a broken soundtrack. So just the other day, I'm at a swim meet. Um, I'm a timer cause I'm so generous with my time servant leader. Mm -hmm. And, um, this girl gets out of the pool and she says to her mom, I'm the slowest swimmer ever. I'm the worst swimmer on the team. I'm terrible. And she walks off and I immediately think those are broken soundtracks. Uh -huh. Like, and that's a moment to go, Whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. It's, you could say I'm disappointed in how I swam. That's, that's, that's true. Like you can be disappointed. Like, great. You're not, you're not trying to go like, no, you're the best swimmer ever when you lost, like you lost. So that's not helpful to lie, but you don't want to say 
label statements like I'm the slowest person ever. I'm the worst. And you don't want those to take root and you don't want those to get repetitive and you don't want those to spread to other parts of their life. I'm the worst at math. I'll never be good at math. So listening for words like now you're 12, like you, you, let's say you lived to 82. You got like, that's like 70 years to learn math. It's too early to say never. Like it's too early to say never. Let's talk about that. And then also going, okay, our family, what are our soundtracks? Like one of ours is, um, uh, we don't show up hungry. We don't show up hungry. So if somebody say we're going on a road trip to somebody's house, we don't roll in a hot mess at like 6 PM and also expect dinner. If they've said ahead of time, Hey, we'd love to have a barbecue when you get here. Cool. But we don't show up hungry going, Hey, not only are we staying here, we demand you feed us. That's a small, like micro soundtrack on a macro soundtrack of we're considerate of other people. So we'll stop an hour before and eat dinner before we get there. So we don't show up hungry. So that's the kind mm. of thing that it's, it's not a huge deal, but it is one of those things that we're trying to instill into our kids and go, Hey, here's, you know, here, you know, or like, we always like, we're always talking to our kids, like, we'll check the motive. Like the thing you heard, was there a motive? The person who said it, did they have a motive? And if there was a motive, then, you know, be careful about what information you're accepting. Like without, like just assume there's a motive, you know? And so, or, you know, here's how to use your phone and there's soundtracks around that. Like here's how to be deliberate about that. So hmm. I think you can soundtrack any part of life. And again, kids, kids get pretty good at it pretty quickly. Um, that's brilliant. And I think that, uh, as much as my wife and I have tried to create the right soundtracks, I'm sure there's going to be some that they've picked up on that we didn't necessarily intend to the deep cuts, the, uh, the B sides, sure. you know, deep all that. Cuts. That's funny <laughs> that, uh, people are going to, uh, learn about in therapy. Okay. So, uh, let me ask you about your YouTube channel, uh, because I know that you've, uh, put some effort into that, just launched it. So tell us about obviously where to find you and, and all the, you mentioned the podcast and the books, but tell us about YouTube as well. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm loving the podcast exponentially more than my YouTube. I'm just not good at YouTube. Okay. Like I'm just not like, I share a ton of content. I've got a bunch of ideas, but I'm finding the more I do it, like, here's what I told people, especially with the pandemic. This is a great time for you to say, what would have made this easier? What would have made this easier? And answer that question and then go build that. So a year from now, you have that thing. So I said, wow, okay, it's March of 2020. All my live events just got put on pause. What would have made this easier? Um, having a YouTube channel would have made it easier. Having a podcast would have made it easier. I could have had another way to communicate with clients, to share ideas, a different audience, like all these things. So let me go build that. So that's what I did with YouTube. As I said, okay, I need to be more involved in that. Like, okay, well, let's let's build a YouTube channel. Uh, podcast. Like I want to do a podcast. I've, I've, I did one like two years ago that had eight episodes and failed miserably. Cause I kind of showed up and I was like, I'm John Acob. I'll just, people will listen. And it was garbage. And it was like, it was really like an ego play more than anything. And so this one, I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a great podcast. Like I did an interview with Greg Sankey, um, who is the sec commissioner and the sec led the sports world in the middle of the pandemic, like every other league watched what they did and they did it. Yes. And not only that, they just had Texas and Oklahoma added to it. And he like huge man of faith, but brilliant leader. Oh my gosh. And that episode, like the things I learned as, as just the interviewer and the things I think other people like, it was unbelievable to mm. hear his approach to life and how he like, how he reads and what he does. And so like, that's been really fun. Mm. So I think, you know, for me, um, I kind of have said, okay, here's five new things I want to try. Which are the things in a priority I'm going to put time on and energy on? And like podcast is the one that I'm like, oh man, like in the name of the podcast is all it takes is a goal. And like, if you only listen to one episode, Greg Sankey, because he's unbelievable. If uh, I, I like to ask people this question, uh, Spielberg was once asked, if only two movies that you've created live on, what would they be? And he said Schindler's List and E.T. Oh, man, what range? Yeah, exactly. It'd be hard to sum it up for a guy like him. Um, and it'd be hard for you as well. So of the seven books, give me one. Obviously, the soundtracks is, is the most recent. But, you know, what? give me maybe one talk you do, maybe one book that you've written. You mentioned one podcast. What should live on? Um, I mean, soundtracks, I think is my best book. And I think that everyone needs it because we all tend to overthink. Um, and then, um, 
I mean, I think do over, if you're in transition, do over is really, really helpful. And I think everybody's in transition. Yeah. And so it really breaks down. I think the thing that's been really fun for me to share with that book is um, it's about change ultimately. And there's only two types of change that you ever have to deal with. And they're voluntary and involuntary. Mm. involuntary. So I voluntarily changed my life. Something happens outside my control. And it's a vertical line. And then there's a horizontal line that goes from negative to positive because those are the two types of things. So once you see mm. that, you go, oh, a voluntary negative change is when I've hit a ceiling where I'm continuing to do the same old thing and I'm stuck, you know? And so I think that framework where it walks through those four kind of change moments is really helpful and encouraging because people can go, oh, I'm just, I'm just at a ceiling moment or I'm in a bump moment. And an, an involuntary negative change is a bump where your, you know, your life gets thrown for a curve in a way you weren't expecting. And so what are some practical things you can do to get out of that? That's, I've had a lot of fun sharing that, sharing that approach. Mm, that's a great idea. Okay. Before I let you go, I came to know you because of your book, Stuff Christians Like, sure. which is still hilarious. Oh, thanks. Um, give me the premise behind that real quickly. And a couple of your favorite, and they might even be new. They're not even in the book. Yeah. I mean, stuff Christians like the premise. It was a complete ripoff, first of all. So, like, there was a website called Stuff White People Like that just made fun of Caucasia. And growing up in the church, it always bothered me that Christians tend to take popular secular ideas and like put some Jesus on them and then just steal them. And so, I wanted to create a list of things. And so, the very first idea was Stuff Christians Like ripping off popular secular ideas. And I thought I'd write about it for a week and get bored of it, like all my other terrible ideas. Um, and then people just started showing up to read it. And so that's how it started was me just riffing on like, this is weird that we do this. This is, mm -hmm. you know, and I think what was fun about it was I held up a mirror, but I was in the image too. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like, I don't like to mock. Like the Bible is very clear about God's opinion of mockers. Like it doesn't pull punches. And so I wanted to say like, if I ever pointed a finger, I wanted to point the finger at me, not somebody else. And so it just became this kind of running list of like, this is kind of silly or this is kind of weird. Like, you know, like big church, small church that like, like that small church is like, oh man, big churches, they're terrible. As if a bus of a thousand people showed up, you'd be like, no, you can't come in. Like as if you'd stop that. And then like, so like, and, and then like big churches going, oh, small churches aren't successful or whatever. Like that's a weird dynamic. I mean, I think one of my favorite ones was, wishing you had a shirt that said, I direct my, I direct deposit my tithe that you could wear on Sunday so that people wouldn't judge you. Cause they don't know you're giving directly online. Like they just assume you hate Jesus cause you pass the offering. So like that was one that was funny. I mean, I'm, I was blown away that Zondervan let me even write the book. Um, yeah. Cause the first, and, and the introduction, the very first line of the book is if you buy this book, God will make you rich. <laughs> and like, that is like that. They let me write that. Was, and then the second line is I was going to say, if you got, if you read it, but if you get it at the library, you're not getting the same blessing. That's right. Like, um, That's right. And then the first chapter was that Christians rank honeymoon sex slightly higher than um, the second coming of Jesus. Cause that like there were kids in college. It was like, I want them to come back, but not before I get married. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And so like that they let me like put ideas like that and like kudos to them. Like they, they had such a great sense of humor about it. And it was, and at the time, I don't know if it would have been as successful now as it was then, because <clears throat> I think there's a lot of smart Christians writing smart comedy now. Hmm. And I wasn't a first by any means, gosh, but there was less competition, less blogs, less. Yeah. There just weren't a lot of people in the space. And so that was part of why it was fun was that I think there were a lot of people that were excited about it because there just wasn't a lot of it. And now I think there's a lot of great comedy that, that does that. You have any new ones you want to add? No, I, I, I mean, I feel like I told somebody, they were like, why'd you stop writing? And I was like, cause I wrote it for 10 years. Like eventually you're like, how many hipster worship leader jokes can I do? You know, <laughs> like I, you know, before I always, you know, I, I still joke that like, God only gives Hillsong 12 minute songs. Like he gives <laughs> everyone else three minute songs, but for some reason he's like, nah, this need, I need you to guys, this is a dozen. A dozen minutes is what this is. And so like, I still think about stuff like that. Um, it's still, you know, it, it happens like when I'm around the environment, but I've been out of the game so long. And I thought that I felt like there were other fresh voices that were doing a better job of it. And like, again, I had done it for 10 years and I was like, man, like 
okay, I'm writing about a, a V-neck. Like I can only do so many, <laughs> so many V-neck jokes where, you know, like at some point you're like, okay, this is skinny jeans. Oh, it's crazy. Worship leaders have skinny jeans. The one joke that I do that sometimes gets me in trouble is I always joke with wor my worship leader friends, like don't do a mini sermon at the end mm. of the thing because like the pastor didn't get on the drums. Yeah. Like, cause he would suck at the drums. Yeah. And so like when there's been a moment deliberately created at a conference, at a yeah. certain whatever, and you just decide to riff, like, cause you don't, you don't show up on Sunday and just, just make stuff up. Like you have mm. a plan, like you've got your thing. And then when somebody is like, you know what, I'm a guitar player, but I own a Bible. I'm going to just go off on like a four minute jag. And that's the last thing people are going to remember. Every visitor, the thing I'm sending them home with is my made up on the spot riff. And like, Dude, just compare that to you as a pastor. If you got up or like, hey, they left the instruments up here, so I'm just gonna bang away at this electric guitar and like, or like they left an acoustic guitar. I'm just gonna grab this and try to play Oasis Wonderwall. Yeah. Like I learned it in college. So like worship <laughs> like leaders would be wrong. <laughs> they'd be horrified. And so I think just like some of that is stuff that I still again, like there's worship leaders who are great at the mini sermon. Like they're talented at that, but there's also times where it's it's okay to end the thing yeah like it's okay like there's there's a bow on it let's not add a triple bow or a bonus sermon or a right. bonus prayer after like not every sermon not every worship experience needs a ps 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 right right the lord just gave this to me yeah i don't, I don't think so i don't know if he did I don't, I don't, like sit on that for like a week see if he's still giving it to you i had a friend who said uh, he's a musician and he said people would come up to him and be like, God gave me this song for you. And he would always wanted to say, he gave it to you because he didn't want it because it's not any good. <laughs> like it wasn't good enough for the angels. Like, no, this is a terrible song. So I, I don't know. Yeah, you keep it. I, you know what? I don't, I can't receive this one. This is, oh, this man. is for you. So I still think about that when I get together with friends who are worship leaders and we, we, uh, we joke about that. But I, that's the, I joke with our worship leaders and say, listen, I don't sing when I preach. Don't preach when you sing. Let's just <laughs> yeah, keep, yeah, keep yeah. the line there. Yeah. And we had a, we had a worship leader just go rogue during communion one time and she ended up thanking God for Calgary. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to Calvary. So sure, sure. it was awesome. This is fine if you're in Canada. Yeah. It's probably I mean, beautiful. If we're going to sing Oh Canada. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. If you're a Canadian church, you're probably excited. I mean, thank them for Toronto while you're at it. Ottawa. I mean, I don't know why you got to point New out Foundland. Calgary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like Prince Edward Island. There's lots exactly. of places in Canada worthy of his praise. <laughs> well, we'll end, we'll end on that, John. A cuff. Thank you. This has been great, man. I really appreciate all you do. And thanks for helping the church laugh at itself, but also learn from itself too. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for listening. And I just love that guy. I'm using that phrase, running through a field with a ribbon. Uh, boy, that's such a great metaphor. Love that. Uh, check out more from John. Read his book, Soundtracks. It's so, so good. Uh, and if this episode was helpful, please share it with somebody else. Get the word out about what we're doing. Leave us a review. I would really, really appreciate it. And as always, we are working with Compassion.com uh, slash Rusty. Just go there and you can sponsor a child today. Next week, our conversation turns to basketball. Yep, it's about time for the NBA to kick off again. And my co-host Brad is back with us to talk all things NBA basketball. Brad happens to also be a godfather to a very famous college football quarterback. We'll reveal that next week. And that's my conversation with Brad next week as we talk all things NBA, get you ready for the season. Thanks for being with us, and as always, keep it simple. Take a moment and subscribe to the podcast so you'll get it delivered every week. And subscribe to the Rusty George YouTube channel for more devotionals, messages, and fun videos. Thank you for listening to Leading Simple. Learn.